morning. May God's grace be healing for you today. Amen. Welcome to worship this morning. As we gather in this space, there are a few announcements I bring before you, and I invite you to see the announcement slides that conclude our service as well for more information. First, a few words about today's service. Today, we welcome Reverend Jeremy Smith as our guest preacher. Jeremy serves at First Church Seattle downtown. He is also uh, known for his blog, Hacking Christianity, in which he seeks to bring faith community around the intersection of progressive theology, technology, and geek culture. So check him out in that space as well. Today, uh, Jeremy brings before us his favorite healing story in scripture. And I found his message to be one that was good news for me, and I hope that it will be for you this morning as well. Another word about this morning's service is that this morning's service was pre prepared further in advance than we normally would do so. So I invite you, if there is a prayer request or a uh, current event that is happening that we would normally give our attention to in worship, I invite you, gathering in the space as the body of Christ, to raise those things before us using the comment feature. We, of course, do the work of worship, all of us together, wherever we are and however we come to this space. Going forward this week, I would remind you to please continue to connect with Pastor Annie Hayes if you have pastoral care emergencies while I am away. And finally, next week, you are invited for worship to join with our friends at Edmonds United Methodist Church. They worship online at 10 a.m. You can find them through their website and their Facebook page. So I invite you to join in that space and join our siblings in Christ for worship that day. Now, as we come into this space and gather together, I invite you to greet one another in Christian peace and remember that each and every one of us come to this space as beloved children of God. God, today we come to praise you. We come to be healed by your truth, that we are your beloved children. Help us today to see all the more clearly the vision that you have for us. Through Christ with the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture tells one of the healing stories from Jesus' ministry. This is the favorite healing story of our guest preacher, Reverend Jeremy Smith of First Church, Seattle. The story speaks to him of dramatic discomfort, divine persistence, and our call to co-create the mission of Jesus. Hear this reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. These are holy words. Thanks be to God. I want to 
wanted to talk kind of like we would do during um, children's time on a Sunday morning since we haven't had a chance to do that. So I wanted to talk to you today about the word transformation. Do you know that word? Mm -hmm. You do? Can you tell us about it? It's a big, I think it was a big word. I'm, I would love to hear how you understand it. I understand uh, this green banana. Yes. This, this green banana is going to turn into a yellow banana. Yes. Thank you for bringing something to show us. I was hoping you would bring something to show us. Yeah. I asked the kids who came to bring something that changed because that's how we talk about transformation, something that changes. So you brought bananas. That's an excellent example. I have something for you that changes. A very ordinary looking spoon, right? Nothing different about it. Are you ready? Look what happens when I put, oh, here we go. An ice pack, ordinary ice pack, ordinary spoon. I'm wrapping the spoon in the ice pack. Oh no, it's not changing. Hold on, maybe it's not cold enough. Oh, it's starting to. This ice pack was left out a little bit, so it's not as cold. Sometimes change takes a little while. It doesn't always happen quickly. That's an important lesson. That's actually part of our lesson today. There we go. It's starting. Can you see that it's starting to change color? Well, how can it change color from white to blue? I know. This one changes from white to blue. It's unexpected. This one, I don't know how it does that. I don't know necessarily the science behind it. I just know that it changes when it gets cold. And so I have another spoon that changes when it gets hot. That one changes to white. It starts out blue and it changes to white if it's really hot. And they use that sometimes for um, baby spoons so that you don't put anything too hot on the spoon. But there we go, now it's really changing. Uh -huh. So sometimes change is unexpected, but transformation is all about change. And I wanted to talk about this because it's something that's really important in our faith and when we try to follow Jesus. We believe that Jesus can change us and change our lives, right? We've talked about this before. Do you have any ways which Jesus can change you? Uh, or know any stories when Jesus changes other people? Um, oh, the story went, the story went on um, a person like, the, the, so there's this story inside the Bible and mm -hmm. Jesus was teaching a crowd, and there was this injured friend that had a broken leg and yes. couldn't walk, so they had to lower him under inside the room by the roof, and then Jesus healed him. So yes, yeah, that's like yes. From for now, uh, from from then on, and then he started to walk. Yes, that's a perfect story, and that's exactly one of the stories that I wanted to talk to you about is a healing story. There's a lot of stories of Jesus healing people. And the one I want to tell you today is a bit similar to the one you just shared with us. Thanks, Aram. This is a story, and it is the story where Jesus helps heal someone who's blind. So here's the picture of it that they have in this Bible. This is the picture for us. And I'll read this story. It says, a blind man felt his friends pulling him through the noisy crowd. Is Jesus really going to be able to heal me, he wondered. At last, he heard one of his friends pleading, Master, we beg you, touch our friend so he can see again. Then the blind man felt Jesus' hands gently touch his eyes. Can you see anything? Jesus asked him. I can see people, but they look like trees walking around. So Jesus put his hands onto the man's eyes again. This time, the man looked around in wonder. Wow, now I can see clearly. So this is another story about healing, a way that Jesus helps the man to see. And one of the things that's interesting about this story of healing is that the change didn't happen all at once. At first, he could see, but it looked kind of like trees. It was really fuzzy. And then Jesus healed again, and then he could see really clearly. It's the so same you, thing as the banana. It's like this one is green, yeah. and then it brings you to kind of like over here is a big yellow and green. and yes. then. Completely yellow. That's right. And I love that you brought that as an example because that's how change happens. When we try and follow Jesus, some, some of us might have a story, kind of like the first story you shared, the healing story, where one minute our leg is broken and the next Jesus heals us. 
Some of us have a story where we are changed really fast, where we know God's love and suddenly we behave very differently. And some of us have stories like the banana or like the story where we see a little bit and then we see a little more. We go from green to a little more yellow to a little more yellow. We take a little time to change like this spoon. But the good news is that all of that is still God working through us to change us. And God changes us so that we can show more love in the world, so we can see people as who they are and as God wants them to be, right? Thank you so much for sharing with me. I'm going to say a prayer together. Will you say a prayer with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to say my prayer this way today. Dear God, thank you for being a God who heals us. Sometimes it happens slowly and sometimes it happens fast. But thank you that every day you work to make us a little better, a little healthier, a little stronger, more well, so we can see and love others clearly. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable not to each other, but to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During this isolation season, many of us have caught up on serial TV shows or just mindlessly escaped into reality television because our reality is so overwhelming. It is little wonder that we love stories about transformation. Queer Eye has the Fab Five transform someone uh, in just a few days from drab to fab. It's a holistic transformation. Clothes, hair, redecorating their home, teaching them to cook, Karamo fixing their culture, their conflict or lack of connection they have in just a few days, in 40 minutes. All that happens. The transformation is quick and dramatic. A transformation we wish for ourselves after 120 days apart, surrounded by the weight of what is around us and seemingly unable to fix or change even at home. There's so many of these shows, whether they are designing on a dime, loving or listing it, next in fashion, or making the cut. The transformation in reality TV is just a few days or hours, and it's always dramatic. My favorite, still on the air after being uh, rebooted, is a Food Network show called Restaurant Impossible, hosted by restaurateur Robert Irving. If you're not familiar with Restaurant Impossible, it's a show about restaurant makeovers. Chief uh, Chef Irvine comes in and fixes dying restaurants that are losing money and customers. He has $1,000, uh, $10,000, and two days to work his magic employing an interior designer for the front of the house while he does the food and business model work. Many restaurants need a lot of help. From tasting a meatball and saying it tastes like ground up baby food, stopping some diners from finishing their drinks because he found salmonella in the ice machine, which is in a disturbing number of shows. Or a restaurant called Sweet Tea whose sweet tea tastes terrible, 
which personally affronts this Oklahomans. 16 seasons later, it's clear many restaurants need a lot of help, as do we all. The appeal of Restaurant Impossible for me is that in every episode, Chef Irvine is dealing with the same problem. The decor is different, the kitchen sanitation is different, the menus are different, the owners are different, but each one is dealing with the exact same problem. They are doing things how they've always done them. They are unable to break free from the entrenched past and seek a different way of being. They are unable to see the transformation possible for them. Chef Irvine confronts them, teaches them what to keep on the menu, how to rework their relationships behind the scenes so they can begin to practice how to change. And then in just two days, not a ton of cash, but a willingness to be changed. Transformation is possible even for the most entrenched of situations. And that is a good word for us as well. I love this scripture passage today. In this scripture passage today, there are three ways that Jesus acts differently than we expect. Three ways that Jesus challenges our conceptions. And in those three ways, Christ pushes against the complacency that we might have and plants the spirit of a, the seed of a boundary-pushing spirit in our great Northwestern church churches. It's one of my favorite stories about transformation because it meets us where we are no matter what. First, transformation has to do with crossing that line in the sand. In Jesus' time, most persons who were blind were brought into the villages to panhandle at the gates or at the synagogues' entrances. If they had the maximum exposure to the most amount of people, uh, they might get the right amount of alms to make it through their day. But when the blind man was brought to Jesus, Jesus took him by the hand and took him outside of the village. This doesn't happen elsewhere in stories about Jesus. Jesus healed um, in front of hundreds, dramatic healings of sick people or raising of the dead, made for TV healings, transformation. But here, Jesus took the man beyond the village walls and healed him in relative privacy. The blind man had staked out his post and believed that all he needed in life was in that circle. Likewise, when we suffer from an ailment or we have a trauma in our past, we limit the extent of where we go. We don't believe transformation is possible. Or the other side of the spectrum, when we reach great success, make a name for ourselves, we often rest on our laurels. Both are challenged by Christ in this passage. When we limit where we place our hope, we miss out on the opportunities just beyond that my first church that I served was in Winthrop, a suburb of Boston. Um, it was established in 1630. Now, sometime after that, a shipload of settlers arrived on American soil. The first year, they established the town site. The next year, they, erected a they got a town government. The third year, the town government planned to blaze a trail and build a road just five miles westward into the wilderness. And in the fourth year, the citizens tried to run their elected officials out of town because they thought it was a wasted effort to build a five-mile road west into the wilderness. Who needed to ever go that far anyway? Here were a group of people that had the vision to go 600 miles across the ocean, 66 days at sea, overcoming great obstacles to get there, but within a few years, they were not even able to see five miles out into their town out of their town. They had lost their pioneering spirit. So many times we are called to expand our circles when we feel overwhelmed by the calls for justice, for confronting racist systems and our own biases. It could feel better to draw a circle and stay inside it. But we are called to cross the line in the sand and seek transformation of ourselves and Second, transformation is about doing something today so that others can do something more tomorrow. In the passage, Jesus seems to make a mistake. He heals the man twice. He spits in the man's eyes, places his hands on them, and heals the man first. And the blind man could only see people that looked like trees walking. Everything was fuzzy. 
Jesus then seems to perfect his healing powers on the man the second time, and he is fully healed. It is obvious that Jesus' powers of healing were not overwhelmed or ineffective, but Jesus did take two tries for a reason. I believe one of those reasons was to remind us that when we hope for something, it sometimes takes stages for it to become a reality. This July is the 51st anniversary of landing on the moon. On January 27, 1967, Apollo 1 blew up in space, killing three astronauts in a heartbeat, a tragedy, and NASA could have given up. They could have grieved their lost heroes, uh, but instead they solved the problem. And 10 months later, the unmanned Apollo 4 was a success. 11 months after that, Apollo 7 crew successfully completed Apollo 1's original mission. And on Christmas Eve of that year, uh, 1968, Apollo 8 er orbited the moon. And then finally, on July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 uh, actually set foot on the moon. And then Apollo 13 got Tom Hanks into space, or someone that looks like Tom Hanks. Transformation is by stages. We have the vision that compels us and Christ that compels us to cross the boundaries and trust when things are still in process. So perhaps being bold is allowing imperfect ideas to move forward, perfecting them as they go along, releasing new versions of our bold ideas like updates to our phones. That takes the courage of our our leadership, grace from our congregation, and uh, awareness of our community as we lift up new things in prayer and support especially as we step into areas of discomfort, of challenging our privileges that we hold dear or that we aren't even aware that we have because we trust that transformation takes stages and it allows us to shepherd one another without requiring that we're all at the same stage but knowing that each one must draw the circles wide. My final thought is this. Persistence has to do with, uh, transformation has to do with being, in a diff- being aware you're in a different place than before. When Jesus heals the person, he tells them not to go back into the village. We know this is a continuation of Mark's insistence that no one knows about Jesus' divinity, divinity, but it's also telling to me that Jesus tells the guy to go home. Skip the village entirely, just go home. He was taken from the village to be changed, and he was not to go Maybe he needed to go home to figure out how to be his new self, and he would revisit the village once he had changed enough to uh, accept the formerly blind man. It is in our history as a church and a nation to believe in transformation, to believe that something more is in front of us. Some of us may wonder how we lost our own sense of that spirit in our personal, professional, and spiritual lives. Maybe we had advanced in age and lost abilities we once cherished, but in Christ we are called to leave our old villages and bring our talents that we still have to a new one that needs us exactly as we are. Maybe we have recently moved or began attending a new church. In Christ we have a first stage of healing and rejuvenation and we are invited to persist in our vision until we've received the next. Maybe our hearts ache and our hands itch and our gut clenches with our new sense of ourselves that doesn't fit in with our friends and our family around us. But friends, in Christ, we do not have to wait to be accepted, but we already are given a grace before we are aware and empowered to live boldly into our new sense of ourselves. This biblical story reminds us that we have in our homes in Christ and in our common fellowship And we go to Christ and our community for these moments when things are ready to change. We could take the time we need to be transformed, and and then we go back to the village ready to transform it as well. Because in closing, we are called to go and tell one another that transformation is possible. I read another story about a miraculous healing. There was a woman named Rose Crawford who had been blind for 50 years. She went to go get eye surgery, and as the doctor pulled the bandages from her eyes, um, she wept for joy. For the first time in 50 years, she saw a dazzling and beautiful world of form and color. It was a celebration and a tragedy. You see, for the last 20 years of her blindness, it was unnecessary. They had developed this surgery technique 20 years before, and she just didn't know that the techniques had been developed. 
Her doctor was quoted as saying, quote, she just figured there was nothing that could be done about her condition. Had she otherwise, 20 years of her life could have been very different. Had no one told her? Had her doctors not told her about the advances in eye care? Had a neighbor, a single one of her friends, or worse, had she given up hope in those first years of her life? And that, as, that it wasn't until much later in life she found the secret hope that had been there 20 years earlier. For this woman, transformation was possible, but the persistent chase after transformation had been abandoned. We are called to a persistent spirit, one that reminds us we are always in need of healing, transformation, liberation. Throughout Scripture, we see this common theme of already being on a path but not arriving yet at a destination. Jesus healed a, mind, a blind man, but the first stage was the already but not yet healed, the fuzziness. The Apostle Paul believed that the end of the world when, when the reign of God would come in its fullness was already begun, but not yet completed. The author of Revelation dreamed of a world where the reign of God had come to spark an imagination with us that we are in the already but not yet. And today, Olympic gymnasts and young maestros of music were recognized before they were fully developed, already, but not yet. My hope is that we also persist beyond discomfort, beyond falling short, to seek a vision that matches and moves forward our community to the already, but not yet. May Jesus Christ also spit on our eyes so that we too may see Christ more clearly all around us, and encourage us to bold action in his name. Friends, we are in the middle of being transformed. May we live into it anew. Glory be to God. Amen. In the bowl there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, but at last will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter there's a spring that was to be, unrevealed until this season something will freely into God's already and not yet promises. Know that every gift we make of ourselves and our resources goes to support the ministries we are already about. Ministries that feed and clothe and bring hope to people in our community. At the same time, the gifts we bring are an investment in that promise Christ is yet fulfilling. It is an investment in disciples yet to be reached in hearts yet to be transformed, in ministries we will yet dream of tomorrow. And so, my friends, I invite you once more to continue to participate with that promise, the already and the not yet, that God is working through us. You can continue to make your gifts to our local congregation by giving through the church office or through the website snohomishumc.org.
let us pray. Dear God, the great physician, the one who heals hearts and bodies and communities alike, we remember the ways you are longing to heal what is broken, what is sick in our own lives. We offer them to you with humility and with hope. In the same spirit, we raise our community before you, where hatred and division and rhetoric make it impossible for us to really, truly see each other. Lord God, we pray what sounds a strange prayer spit in our eyes once more, that we might see anew. Lord God, do it again until we see as you see. We pray this healing upon broken relationships, broken trust, broken systems which thrive off spiritual blindness. May sight be restored throughout our nation and across the nations of the world. May your church stretched around the globe come to be the first to line up for healing, coming in repentance, aware of the ways we have too often continued cycles of violence, of death and harm upon others when we have refused to see them as your beloved. Give us all faithful eyes to see the vision that is already and not yet. Such is the vision Christ extended before us. Such is the vision he taught us to live and pray into being when we pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, go this day healed by the love and grace of Christ. Go this day with eyes open to see the vision that Christ yet puts before us. Amen. Thank you.